please open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Or we could say 1 Corinthians if it helps. Sometimes I just throw something in there just for Andrew. It's because I laugh at his jokes and he laughs at my jokes. We edify each other. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 1. You say, Pastor, this is not Romans. Yes, it is not Romans <laughs> this morning. Uh, sometimes I feel led to preach a message on a subject that I believe is helpful and necessary uh, for our church, and I feel led this morning to do that. And so I believe this will be a help. I think this is probably a very very well-known passage of Scripture for most of the people in our church, but it's one that for every person ought to be a passage of Scripture that we look at ourselves in light of. And so we're going to read this morning, beginning in verse 17. Paul said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Pay special attention to the next several verses. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Boy, that's a good verse for the Scripture memory challenge this evening if you're looking for one. In verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Father, as we look at this passage of Scripture today, May we look at ourselves and to be desirous of being anything required in order for Christ Jesus to be unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We cannot emphasize the need for lost people to hear the gospel, and for souls to be the driving, the driving most important desire of our hearts to be the salvation of souls, lost souls of men. I think that a representative part of us many days is, are so busy that at the end of the day, if we asked ourselves a question that would evaluate the worth of our day, 
did I make an impact for lost souls today? Well, as we get on average, usually 365 days per year, and if on the average day we were to ask the question, did my day impact souls for eternity? I don't know what the averages would be. It certainly would be different for every single individual. We know that, don't we? In other words, some people, it seems, every day made an impact for souls. And some people, it seems, almost, almost never make an impact for souls on a, on a given individual day. Today, I'm not trying to present a message that says this is the way this is the means. This is how souls should be reached. Today, I want us to understand that God is very interested in the lost coming to Jesus. In the beginning of our passage in 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to a church that is absolutely divided up over differences in what they think a church ought to be about and differences in who they think really understands or who they should follow in the church. This is the passage where people said, I'm of Paul. In other words, you know, the way Paul does ministry, the way Paul preaches, the intellect that Paul has been given by God to be used, that's the way Christians ought to be. They ought to be Pauline believers. And some people said, you know, Paul, you know, he's, he's too much brain and too little heart. I'm of Peter. You know, I, I'm a Peter guy. And uh, others said, I'm of Apollos. You know, he is the guy that, I mean, really he was just a balanced, perfect Christian kind of a guy. And others would say, well, you know, ultimately, I'm, a, I'm of Christ. I, I reject Paul. I reject Peter. I reject Apollos. I reject, you know, these guys. I, I don't care what any man says. I only care what Jesus says. And so they rejected all the apostles that Jesus gave uh, to, to, as their authority in the church. And so... What Paul is saying is this lack of unity in the church is something that we don't want. <clears throat> Matter of fact, he emphasizes here, he said, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius. You know, baptizing is many times the making of disciples. It's, it's understood this person is going to follow Jesus, and the person who baptizes them uh, oftentimes is the person who's going to help them follow Jesus. And Paul said, I'm glad I didn't baptize you. Why would he say that? Well, because he doesn't want them following him. He wants them to follow Christ. And he wants them to follow him as he follows Christ, but he does not want his personality to be what the ministry is about. But Paul does want for souls to come to Jesus. And so then he emphasizes the difference in souls. He said the Jews, they require a sign. You know, Jews were always saying, what sign do you give? Even when Jesus was on the cross, they said, if you're the Son of God, come down off the cross. In other words, they wanted a miraculous sign. It is still part of Jewish culture today. I appreciate a, a friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Philip Savalovsky, uh, is, is uh, the head of Olive Branch Ministries. Very, very balanced Jewish believer who really emphasizes reaching lost Jews for Jesus. And uh, we have a video that Charlie actually showed in Miami Beach last year. And he talked about the Feast of Lights and the importance of uh, the Feast of Lights to the Jews and, the, and then it, the uh, lighting of the Hanukkah, or the celebration of Hanukkah and the lighting of the candles on the menorah. And one of the things that he presented, and I think he's right about it, he gave a lot of evidence for it, is that, the, that Hanukkah is very important to the Jews because they need a miracle to demonstrate that even though God had not spoken to Israel for 400 years before Christ came, that God still authorizes and recognizes Judaism. And so they're grabbing onto Hanukkah to say something supernatural happened here which proves that God endorses us. <laughs> and I think that's probably a pretty good I think that's probably a pretty good evidence of why Hanukkah does have the importance to the Jews of that. That's why they're into the angels and, and a lot of things like that. Now, uh, Paul said in his day, he said the Jews require a sign. He said the Greeks are the opposite. You could show them a sign, they wouldn't believe it. They want reason. They want wisdom. They want to be impressed by the intellectual. 
And Paul said, Jesus ain't none of that. He said, if you're going to believe in Jesus, you're not going to get some sign. And if you believe in Jesus, you're not going to get some brilliant reasoning, reasoning that tickles the intellect. Now, Paul is not saying there's nothing miraculous about Jesus. And he is not saying there is nothing unreasonable or that defies common sense and reason about Jesus. What he's saying is, in a very polite way, he's saying no person has the intellect to be on plane with God's reasoning. And he's saying no person has the ability to recognize how supernatural God is, actually. He said the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. And many times we want to relate to God intellectually. And friend, I don't mean any insult to yourselves or any person on this earth, but I don't care how brilliant you are. When it comes to intellect, God made you with your intellectual limitations, but He is not limited. God's wiser than we are. And so we think, oh, wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. How does God look at us when it comes to wisdom? How, does God, how wise does God think we are? Well, He certainly doesn't esteem us as highly as we esteem ourselves intellectually. That's certainly a truth, isn't it? Okay, that isn't the point of the message that I want to emphasize this morning. Paul emphasized that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. You say, why don't people respect my faith in Jesus Christ? Because it seems stupid to them. That's why, in case you didn't realize it before. It, it's not, they don't see anything supernatural about your faith, and they don't see anything uh, intellectual about your faith. Now, is that to say there's nothing supernatural or intellectual about your faith? That's not the point of the Scripture. That's not what Paul is saying. And that's not what I'm saying here this morning either. I'm simply merely saying that God rejects supernatural signs and God rejects intellect when it comes to winning the lost. And He does it with the power of preaching. Now, let me qualify this morning by saying I'm not going to say this morning that I'm not preaching because I'm sharing the Gospel this morning. I'm, just, I'm preaching the Word of God. So I am preaching this morning. But friend, preaching is not something that is restricted to men who are called, quote, to preach in the church house or on the platform. Preaching is done by saved people to lost people. That is, preaching is the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, is it... Does the Bible have something to say, for instance, about ladies preaching in the church? You know, the Bible actually forbids it. It says women are not to usurp authority over men in the church. I didn't write that. God did. But does the Bible say women aren't to be preachers? I think it's a real mistake to think that because women are to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, and so uh, here we are in the Scripture this morning recognizing that God doesn't need intellectual or supernatural doesn't need us to stage some kind of a performance that will impress people and he doesn't need us to put together a presentation that will impress people into receiving Jesus as their Savior what we need to do is preach the gospel Christian I want to urge us that this this alone should be the focus of what we believe we are as a church and what we believe our purpose is as a ministry it's to preach the gospel to preach the cross of Jesus Christ I do not want to paint today a picture of the cross for sake of time but the cross of Jesus Christ my friend is not a place that any of us can look on and say what a beautiful sight I think that when I picture in my mind the cross of Jesus, I, if I were to see it, I immediately would cover my eyes. Who wants to see Christ bleeding, tortured, dying for sin with His innocent blood being shed as He is being blasphemed? Who wants to see it? My eyes don't want to behold it. But my friend, it has to be preached and people have to see it to recognize that it is only the cross that saves. And it is only the cross that they may come to for their salvation. 
And it's only the cross that any person needs. We must preach the cross. But I wanted to focus today on something that I hope will be a help to us. Verse 25 of the Scripture of our passage this morning says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He goes on further to say, For ye see your calling. Now, <clears throat> I love the way that the, the uh, Scripture segues here, if you will. This is beautiful, isn't it? Speaking of foolish people, you see how that... In other words, he says the foolishness of God is wide, or the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God... Uh, I, I need to read it because I just mis I just turned around. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Speaking of dumb, weak folks, you see how Paul <laughs> instantly says, speaking of you guys to the church at Rome. How do you like that? Pastor, that is not nice. Well, we don't really need to comment on whether or not it's nice or not nice or whatever. The question is, is it true? Literally, as we read the Scripture, we recognize Paul says God is not impressed by man's strength. And God is not impressed by man's wisdom. And speaking of weak, foolish people, hey guys, don't you love that? I do. I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, Todd says it's because I'm a Gen Xer, but I can relate to this. You know, it's a little, you need a good pep talk. Kind of puts you in your place like, so that you can... Uh, you know, realize, okay, I need to take it down a notch when I think I'm smart and strong. I need something to humble me just a little bit. Help me realize, compared to God, I am absolutely less than nothing. Amen. And all of us are. And here we find this in the midst of a passage that's talking about preaching the cross of Jesus. In other words, when we're told, when we're urged, preach Christ! Preach the cross. We ask the question, who am I? And we want an answer like, you're strong enough. You're great enough. But I'm reminded of Moses when he was sent to Egypt to, uh, to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go to a people that didn't want to go. And Moses asked the question, who am I, who am I? And God said, surely I'll be with thee. He never even answered the question about who Moses was. Never said a word to Moses in response to, well, Moses, yeah, I mean, you, you grew up in the household of Pharaoh. So what? He didn't need to grow up in the household of Pharaoh to be used of God. Well, Moses, you know, you're a great orator. No, actually, he stuttered. Well, Moses, I mean, you've got a good constitution. You've got good survival skills. Uh, who was Moses? God said, surely I'll be with thee. Friend... Our call to preach the gospel has nothing to do with what we know and how we can present it. Our call to preach the gospel has to do with who Jesus is and His cross. That's where the power of preaching is. It's in the very opposite of what we see as a strength. Well, we see somebody, boy, I don't know, he's pretty intelligent. I don't know if I could, I just don't know if I could you know, go one-on-one -on -one with him intellectually. Well, don't. Preach the gospel. Well, I don't know. You know, that guy's uh, pretty strong. I don't even know if I could even stand up to his kind of strength. Well, don't. Just preach the gospel. See. And so then Paul helps to insult them some more. Insult us some more, we could say. And really, it isn't insulting. It's true. Verse 25, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. <laughs> Speaking of, you know, a, an illustration. Now think about this. Who's Paul writing in the church at Corinth? He's writing people that he took the gospel and preached it to. And he said, well, you see your calling. Now, you'd say, well, this church at Corinth must have been, they probably grabbed this letter and tore it up. No, they didn't. We still got it. Um, how must they have responded when he said, speaking of foolish and weak, 
They'd say, yeah, look what God has done here in Corinth. When Paul and a couple of the men that were with him first went to Corinth, my friend, read about it in Acts. There was no potential there. There was nothing there with regard to being a great church. And yet when Paul was writing this letter, a whole bunch of nothings have been responsible for preaching the gospel and quite a bit of something has come of it. And Paul said, you guys know. You know. Your experience tells you that God doesn't use mighty men. And friend, rather than being offended or insulted by it, they were thrilled by it. Yeah, God can use me. Yeah, I'm the kind of person God can use. Verse 27. He said, But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He called them foolish things. They were described as not very many are wise, not many are mighty, not many are noble. Not, you know, now, now, let's challenge some things really quickly. We've all done this, haven't we? We've looked at a lost person and thought of their potential if they got saved. Right? You know, he's so smart. You know, he's just too smart. But if he could just get saved and use his brains for God, if he could just forget about his brains and get, get saved, he could be used by God. Amen. You know, I mean... He's just got so much talent. I mean, he just oozes with talent. Or she, the voice, just the personality they have. The, uh, if they got saved, man, I'm telling you, they could turn the world upside down for Christ. If they forgot all that. Their position. You know, if a guy with that kind of money and that kind of a position, a noble, got saved, the scope of his influence would be huge. It could be if they forgot about it. In other words, God doesn't need many of those. If God needed many noblemen, do you think He could just make sure that everybody's saved automatically is just wealthy and has a title? Could God do that? Could God, you know, well, you know what, I have a preference for noblemen. <laughs> could God, you know, make sure people that get saved are intellectual? Or, you know, just, you know, you know, reformat the brain, make us smart, help us with personality. Could God do those things? That's a friend, God can do anything. But those things aren't what saves people. It's the preaching of the gospel. It's the preaching of the cross of Jesus. And you know, you can stutter when you preach the cross of Jesus. You can have a hard time with strength and boldness when you preach the cross of Jesus. But if you get it preached, my friend, it's powerful. It's powerful. It doesn't have to do with wealth or position or wisdom or strength. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. John the Baptist had a great ministry that illustrates this. Remember when Jesus said, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind. Why did you go all the way out into the wilderness to hear John the Baptist preach and then to be baptized by him? What was the attraction of John the Baptist? Throw it out there. I'm asking for interaction right now. What was the attraction of John the Baptist? I mean, sure, us guys would like to see a dude wearing a leathern girdle. You know, like, I mean, goes, yeah, you know, he... I mean, He's eating locusts and honey. Yeah, I mean, like, let's go hang with John the Baptist. Yeah, okay, Glenn would be there, right, in an instant. Like, I gotta check this guy out, right? Uh, boy, he must be really smart. He lives in the wilderness. Must be really influential. He lives in the desert. What went you out to see? What went you out to see? Why do people go to hear John the Baptist? 
His message, he was polished, wasn't he? I mean, he just made people feel good when he spoke, didn't he? I mean, he had a golden voice. He had a voice for radio. John the Baptist did. I don't know what his voice sounded like, but I'm telling you, his message was, you know, it was powerful and in your face. And it was from a guy that, you know, didn't look impressive. That was John the Baptist powerful. Remember John the Baptist's motto of his ministry? We read it earlier. He must increase, but I must decrease. Where is the power of John the Baptist? He pointed to the cross. He pointed to Jesus. Friend, I don't want to say this the wrong way. I don't want to be taken too far. But I'm afraid sometimes ministries have too much personality. I'm afraid sometimes our ministries have too much personality. Too little of Jesus. In other words, you could describe a ministry, but would the description ultimately be that's what Jesus is? Or would it be this and this and this and this and this? It's insightful sometimes to say, what is it that makes that what it is? And answer the question. And when you realize, okay, that's what makes it what it is, sometimes you think, well, that isn't what ought to make it what it is. It ought to be Jesus. It ought to be Jesus. Friend, an effective preacher of the Gospel is a person who just preaches the cross. How intellectual is the cross? How intellectual is the cross? It's too intellectual for me. It's too simple to be intellectual. I've spent time before thinking of alternative redemption plans. Have you ever done that just for fun? You ever thought, let's think of a way that God could have redeemed the world without sacrificing His Son. And you realize, you know, the cross is a pretty simple solution. Pretty, pretty basic, pretty straightforward. I can't say that it's fair. I can't say that I could have ever have said, yes, that's what you should do, God. I say, God, Jesus should not have died for me, but He did. But friend, the cross is about as simple as things get. Anyone can preach the cross. Anyone can preach the cross. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. People are looking at the church at Corinth and saying, what's the deal? What's the deal? You know, they dispatched a team to study it and figure out the growth model. Figure out what was working. You know, churches today do that. Biggest church in town, Calvary Chapel. Chuck Smith founded Calvary Chapel on a model. He found a, a group that was successful in methods, the Charismatics. He said the Charismatics are very, very methodically successful. And he found a group of people that kind of represented the groups that he wanted to reach, hippies, and then he took doctrine uh, that was more middle of the road and he merged charismatic methodology and theology a little bit with Baptist theology. So he took basically the Baptist church structure, and preaching style, and he merged it with charismatic growth methods and built the fastest, most rapidly growing church model and the biggest church in Fort Lauderdale's Calvary Chapel works. For building, for building a group, the model. I don't have any commentary on the good or the bad or the otherwise of other ministries. But friend, I know what our growth model needs to be. Preaching the cross. 
And the church at Corinth said, how can you, I mean, that doesn't, what, what is there about the cross? How could that grow? The, the wise, the mighty said, how is that working? How could that do what it does? People trying to figure out how to stop it, how to shut it down, how to oppose it. How do you oppose it? The cross, my friend, is the most powerful, the most powerful force in the world. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. And foolish men can preach it. And weak men can preach it. And despised men can preach it. People without a title, people without a background, people with a bad background. Nothings can preach the gospel and God can save souls as a result of it. He says, In base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Does God have a reason in using unimpressive, unimportant people to preach the gospel? Actually, yes, that no flesh should glory in His presence. I don't have an opinion about people who do this, but I don't tweet when I lead someone to Jesus. Sometimes I want to tell people people got saved, but I'll be honest with you, some years ago I read this verse and I realized this is not about me. It's not for my glory. It's not, it's not some kind of soul winning competition where we put marks in our Bible or notch things up so that we know, you know how many eternal rewards we've got. That no flesh should glory in His presence. My friend, if you preach the Gospel and somebody comes to Jesus and is gloriously saved, God will have the glory. But if somehow you package the Gospel in an impressive way or a powerful way, if a person still comes to Jesus in spite of that, they won't remember you. I think it's fine, and I, I, and I understand this, having spiritual parents in a sense, that is, people that brought you to Jesus. I've had people say before, Pastor Price saved me. I didn't save anybody. Jesus saves. Amen. But what they mean by that is, Pastor's the one that told me about Jesus. It's all right. It's all right. I'm going to tell you something. Better not follow him. Better follow Jesus. <laughs> right? God says that no flesh. God said, I use people like you so that, people, so that no flesh will glory in His presence. Now let me ask you a question. If, in the only opinion that matters, God's mind, God's opinion, the most important thing is to preach the gospel. Should that be important to all of us? It should. Right? Okay, now let me ask you another hypothetical, just, a, a re, a, just for reasoning or for thinking question. If you're brilliant, if you're strong, if you are influential, you have a noble position, or you're powerful, how should you view that in light of the call to preach the gospel. How should you? In all seriousness, God, help, help me to stand aside. Help, help what I am or what you've made me to be. God, help it to be way out of perspective from the cross. Because if somebody prays, say, God, please help me to be uh, God, please save me. I want Jesus to be my Savior. For your sake? I know people have said, well, the only reason I prayed was because my parents. The only reason I prayed to be saved, I didn't want to be saved. The only reason I prayed to be saved so the pastor would leave me alone. You heard this before? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. If a person prays for your sake, for salvation, are they born again? No. Not in your life. Not in your life. God, get me out of the way of the cross, please. God, please get me out of the way of the cross. God, if that person thinks they're going to get some influence or some position from a relationship with me, that will happen because they've prayed for Jesus to save them. God, help them understand they'll go to hell being influenced by me. 
Not that person that thinks that they're in a clique of talented, wise people with intellect. God help them not to. Help them just to see the cross of Jesus. You know, Christian, I think a lot of times we're praying, God help me to be wiser, help me to be more intellectual, help me to be more so I can preach the cross. I mean, actually, I'll be praying the opposite. God give me simple faith. Remind me of my salvation. God give me a clear vision of the cross of Jesus Christ. Help me to understand that it isn't man's wisdom or man's words that will convince people to be saved. It's the Holy Spirit of God. It's the Word of God. And it's the preaching of the cross. And help me to preach it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think most of the time, Christian, when, when believers are saying, well, I would be a better soul winner, but I really don't have, or I, you know, I don't have the person, I don't like talking, I don't have, they talk. maybe what they ought to pray is, God, help me not to be so much. Help me be a whole lot less. Because we think we need to be a whole lot when actually we need to be a whole lot less. And I love how casually the Holy Spirit uses Paul to say to the church at Corinth, do you think you built this? I mean, they need Obama to say, you didn't build that. (laughs) Remember when he said that? Anyway. They need, as believers, to say, I'm nothing. Jesus is everything. And if you come to Jesus, you'll know He's everything, and you'll know you're nothing, and it'll be a great way to be. A great way to live. How well do people fellowship when they don't think too much of themselves? Don't get offended easily. They don't need to be respected too much. It's amazing when we don't think a lot of ourselves how much more effective we are for Jesus Christ. I think sometimes that's the distraction. Some of the distraction is my way, my personality, my influence, my position, who I am. It's about me. And it isn't about me, it's about Jesus. About the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul said this. He said, here's what you are. You're foolish. You're weak. And uh, you confound the mighty. You're base. You're despised. And uh, you make the people that despise you literally be brought to nothing. But he said, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, is that enough? Is that enough? Jesus is made unto us wisdom. Hey, I'm not wise, but Christ is wisdom. Hey, uh, Jesus is righteousness. I'm unrighteous, but He is righteousness. Sanctification. I have now been cleansed. I have now been clean. I love what Jesus said to His disciples. He says, now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Oh, I'm clean. I'm cleansed by Christ Himself. Sanctification. And Jesus is my redemption. Oh, listen, there's nothing in my ability. There's nothing in my position. There's nothing in my strength. And there's nothing in my intellect. But thank God I've been redeemed by Jesus. And that's where everything is. My redemption. Amen. Jesus is enough. Jesus is everything we need. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let him glory in the Lord. We don't need to be celebrated. We don't need to be approved of. We don't need to be applauded. We don't need people to recognize what we bring to the table or what we really are. We need people to realize what Jesus is. Everything that He is. Keep in mind a similar passage of Scripture in Titus. Paul is writing a letter to Titus. and It's a, uh, another one of those letters that kind of makes me pause. and I get a little chuckle out of the actual address. Let's see if I can find it here. Titus chapter 1. I mean, it always takes Titus out of my Bible. I always thought it was after 2 Timothy, but it's not. Um, Paul said in verse 4 of Titus 1, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, our, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city 
as I had appointed thee. <clears throat> now, if you think about this, that's quite a task that Paul tells Titus that he's supposed to do. An elder is a word that's used interchangeably for a bishop or presbytery or pastor. So he's been told to leave a leader of the church, a pastor, in every city uh, as he appointed him. And he, and he gives their qualifications for them. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. So we see that a bishop and elder are the same thing in the text. A bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not giving to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, is that an impressive elder or what? It meets all those qualifications. In verse 10, it says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Now, you talk about, Paul always had a way of like really calling people things, didn't he? He said the Cretans, they have a poet that said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Means they're, you know, lying, gluttonous, lazy people. That's the idea. That's the cultural tendency of those people. And Paul said, Titus, I left you in Crete to ordain elders out of those people. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? I think it is. In other words, what kind of people can God make blameless, husband of one wife, and not having unruly children, given to hospitality, all these qualifications for a bishop that Paul gives, where do the people that meet those qualifications come from the pool of? The Cretans, who are liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. I love this saying, but for the grace of God I am but what I am. Because God can do great things with nothing. My friend, God can do great things with you, and God can do great things with me, but it won't be because of you or because of me. It will be because of the gospel, the cross of Jesus Christ, and it will be because of who Jesus Christ is. That no flesh should glory in His presence. Father, I pray that You would help us to desire to see You do great things with people that really are no better than the Christians, people that are no better than the Corinthians, so that we could know the power of the cross, so that the world could know that literally things that are something are brought to nothing by the simplicity of the cross of Jesus our Savior. Help us to preach it, we ask in His name. Amen. The invitation this morning is simple. I believe that every person here, the best of my knowledge, knows that Jesus is their Savior, and they've been born again, they have eternal life. If you do not, my friend, it's simply through the cross of Jesus, confessing that we are sinners and that Christ is the only one who is without sin, who died for sin, that is our sin. We're going to open our blue hymn books in just a moment to page 394. And as we sing this hymn of invitation, the message is really to believers. The message is, who am I and who is Christ? And my friend, if I'm anything more than foolish, if I'm anything more than weak, then my friend, I have stood myself in the way of the cross. Who am I if I'm anything more than just a person who is a liar, an evil beast, and a slow belly saved by the grace of God? I have placed myself as an obstacle in the way of the cross. We need to answer these questions and we need to be honest before the Lord Jesus Christ and we ought to ask the question, God, why is it that the cross seems to have less effect than it could? My friend, if the cross has less effect than it could in your life and in my life, then could we say it is not because of the cross, it's because of that which stands in the way. It's because we think that we're wiser than we are and we think that we're stronger than we ought to be and we think uh, that we can appeal to the intellect more than we are able to do so. And my friend, God doesn't want that. God wants us to preach the 
across. Aren't you glad it's simple as that, easy as that? Page 394, I surrender all. And as the pianist begins to play this morning, we're going to sing. If God spoke in your heart about it and showed you, you know, we need to surrender to this truth. We need to set aside our pride, set aside ourselves, and make the cross of Jesus everything. My friend, let's do business with God even as we begin the invitation this morning. continues to play. We ought to consider that I think that an invitation like we would have today would be one that all of us ought to participate in. God, I've stood in the way of the cross. I've got to remind me in the way of the cross. I want the word of God, I want the preaching of the cross to be the main thing. The, the package that I presented in needs to be less important, unimportant, so that no flesh be glory in His presence. God, my focus sometimes is wrong. My intentions are are not what they ought to be. And I love the souls of men. I had a desire that people could be saved and look at me and say, oh, we know it wasn't him. It could have only been Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. We'll sing verse 2. All to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Father, thank you for what we've learned this morning, Lord. There's a re-emphasis on the fact that, Lord, you're everything, we're nothing. And Lord, we need you. We need to rest on your strength, Lord. Point folks to you. Lord, just get out of the way. I pray, Father, that um, you would uh, just humbly empower us, Lord. Give us divine appointment and opportunity to be able to do that this week even today. And Father, I pray that uh, we would, as a result, just be more effective, Lord, in our outreach, uh, personally, individually, and then as a church, Lord, here in this community. We, uh, they need it. We need it as well, obviously, but they need it, Lord. That uh, you've uh, left us here, uh, that uh, we would reach others, Lord. We would entrust what you've taught us, Lord, to them. So I pray, Father, that... Uh, we would just learn of you, and Lord, uh, we would just be greatly used as a result. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.